Okay, so for today's presentation, we are going to take a look at uh, an overview of Chapter 18, The Rise of Russia. I'm going to give um, a fair amount of information from the text itself. I would encourage you all to watch the John Green's crash course that talked about Kievian Rus and talked about the Mongols in Russia um, because that talks about the Ivans a bit and talks about the impact of the Mongols and I'm going to use that today in my presentation as well. Uh, lastly, I, I'm going to organize Chapter 18 and the John Green video into what will eventually be a CCOTU doing class. Um, dealing with centralization slash westernization between the years 1250 and 1800. And just to guide you along, 1250 is the estimated time when the Mongols took over, and 1800 is through the era of Catherine the Great. All right, so let's get to the slideshow. Chapter 18, The Rise of Russia. I will admit that I am backtracking a little bit to talk about the Mongols, uh, but... Uh, it's with with purpose in mind. So the Mongols, the Tartars, uh, as nation builders, you got like the visual I used. The Mongols are the Tartars who held over um, control over Russia, brought a lot of things. First of all, they did cr crush Kiev. When they crushed Kievian Rus, that whole, if you will say, city-state empire, um, they were building a new nation. So in the ashes of Kievian Rus will be a new nation thanks to the Mongols. Uh, because what they did is they centralized power away from Kiev and they put it now in the power of Moscow, which at the time was nothing more than a city-state. So now it's going to become a powerful city-state through the different princes that will rule Moscow. Moscow will be centralized as the tributary part of of uh, the Tartar control because Moscow collects the wealth, the money, the affluence, and then gives it to the Mongols. So they played a central role. And, and Moscow will then increase the importance of a concept of a state because it's through Moscow where taxes are collected. It's through Moscow where safety is given. Safety from the different Moscovite city-states, but also safety from the Tartars. So, in essence, through Moscow comes domestic stability. Lastly, Moscow will quickly usurp all the power of being the Russian Orthodox central location. So, if there were elites, they went to Moscow. If there were landed aristocracy, they went and sent delegates to Moscow. And if you were through the, the Orthodox Church, you were in Moscow. This is the beginning of a nation. Now, of course, over time, as this centralization occurs, the Tartars are going to realize they kind of shot themselves in their own foot because they are now the common foe to a more centralized power. Uh, now, the last thing that I think the Tartars do is they create a link between the West and the East, which helps Russia, um, but also uh, separates Russia from Europe, kind of separates it from Asia, uh, and Russia becomes its own Russian identity. And the people that used to be, if you think of the Greek city-states, uh, part of the Moscovite city-states, they're going to start looking at them as something bigger, and that is Russian. Okay, so the Mongols will eventually be conquered, and they are going to leave. And now Moscow here is going to be in control. Over the next uh, couple hundred years, we are going to create a Russian empire. So, what are the problems facing this free Russia? Once free the Mongol rule, Russia faces the following challenges. Number one, few intellectuals, few literates. Um, we are talking about a society that is agrarian, that is backward, that is, it doesn't have an educated aristocracy. Um, it has a wealthy landed, but it doesn't have these intellectuals that will give birth to the Renaissance in Europe, gives birth to the Reformation in Europe. So really, the Enlightenment, the Renaissance, the Reformation, all of these things are of Western Europe, not Eastern Europe slash Russia. And that's just because there were few intellectuals by the year 1250, by the year 1300. Um, now, Russia will have limited trade 
um, with its own goods. Uh, it is not going to be an industrial mega power, so it has no need to send abroad. Now, it does purchase abroad, um, so it has its farming products, it has some wealth, and that wealth then, through an unfavorable balance of trade, is given abroad. Um, what do you think? These are not problems facing um, a country if that country wants to exist. But in my opinion, these are problems facing a country if it chooses to be an empire. Um, you're not going to see many empires lead through agriculture. That's not surprising that, you know, by the 1950s and 1960s, Russia's socialism was going to try and um, fix Russia's agriculture. Um, and it, through its collectivization, it utilizes it while then building upon its manufacturing. So really, the, the issues of the year 13, 14, 1500, 1600, seriously, are the same issues facing Stalin and the post-Stalin regimes. And of course, the end of the Soviet Union. Um, land of different peoples. So you're going to have your Mongolian, you're going to have your Asian, you're going to have your uh, uh, far out beliefs here. You're going to have a huge Muslim contingency here. Um, I don't know. It, it, it gives Russia a different appeal um, and also gives it different challenges. All right, I've elaborated way too much. So how did uh, they centralize? This is for the first part of my CCOT, and westernization comes a little bit later. Ivan the Great. Um, Ivan the Great first became just the Grand Prince of Moscow. And as a Grand Prince of Moscow, he's going to lead the centralization that will lead him to becoming a czar. He views Russia as the third Rome. You have uh, Rome, you have the Byzantine, and now you have Russia. That's why the title Tsar is created, as in Caesar. He will quickly try to become the leader of the Orthodox Church. You could see here in, you know, how they're represented uh, very uh, magnific magnificently. That's not even a word. He realizes that through territory expansion can become uh, a central Russian identity. So he is going to expand typically northward. Uh, what he does is there is a landed aristocracy. And what he does is with this new land that he acquires, he gives it to what I am using here as a military nobility. I think Peter Stearns uses this term. Military nobility are if you follow Ivan you will get land. So he's creating a new aristocracy of landed wealth, but a landed wealth that get their power through him, through the state. Now, some Cossacks uh, or Cossacks um, are going to play a role because, and there's one shown here, is some of them are just peasants and they flee eastward, and some are used by Ivan to purposely move eastward. Nonetheless, the Cossacks, as they span eastward and they create new centers of uh, villages, of cities, of wealth, of trade, they are in, by default, spreading the Russian Empire. They bring with them their faith, they bring with them their trade back with the West. So what you kind of see is some of these Cossacks are fleeing Ivan and they're fleeing Moscow, but at the same time serving Moscow and serving Ivan. Moving on. Now, here is the wealth uh, of land that Ivan the Great took. You hear in uh, the, the blue, this is when Ivan came into power. This is the land that Ivan took, and this is, again, the land that his descendants will take. And you're going to see that waterways are going to become a eventual, over here, especially the Black Sea, are going to become very, very important um, for Russia to take over. You'll see that on its outskirts, you have the Ottomans. You have Poland slash Lithuania, which at one time was an empire, and you have Sweden. You'll notice there is no Finland. So these are the powers towards the west that kind of 
are going to be the new goals of Peter the Great and Catherine the Great. How much of this western land will they be able to take? Ivan the Terrible, cute little story. Oh no, what did I just do? <laughs> Ivan the Territory, uh, Ivan the Terrible, he expands uh, towards Siberia. Uh, the reason why he earns the name Ivan the Terrible is because he attacks the boyars or the boyars. Um, the boyars are the landed aristocracy, just a different name. So he starts attacking the landed aristocracy, kind of chipping them down a bit. So what Ivan the Great did is he created his own nobility, and then over time, Ivan the Terrible took it a step further by attacking the nobility that had existed before him, uh, the landed aristocracy. This is a way of centralization once again. Uh, Ivan the Terrible and, of course, uh, Ivan the Third, they did create what is considered an absolute monarchy. Neither them nor Peter the Great or Catherine the Great are ever going to rule by parliamentary procedures, people. We are not going to talk about people standing up and chirping their own opinions and, you know, giving their value system upon the, the crown. It is a top-down approach. All of them appreciate. Now, let's take about take a look, and now we shouldn't be surprised that we are going to have Tsar Nicholas II. We shouldn't be surprised that we're going to have Joseph Stalin. We shouldn't be surprised that in Russia, they are used to centralization, socialism, top-down Vladimir Putin. Just well, in, the, in, in China, we shouldn't be surprised that in China, they too have a top-down approach because of just Confucianism and the, the history of dynasties. Okay, so when Ivan the Terrible uh, passes away, he dies without an heir, and you'll see the rise of the Romanov family. The book talks about the time of troubles, which a lot of people start killing each other. The boyars are tight, fighting with each other. Um, now, this was a great opportunity between the year 1604 and 1613 for um, new changes on limitation of the monarch to occur. This is where a Magna Carta time period could have stepped in. Uh, just think about it, 1600. Think about what's going on in Western Europe. But that is not what happens. Um, a new czar is elected from the Romanov family, and the Romanov family will lead all the way through Tsar Nicholas II, but there is no constraints on their power. The first Romanov leaders are going to, like Michael Romanov here, shown as the head of this, the church and the state, are going to uh, expand, expel some foreign invaders like the Poles that had invi invaded, and then he will start attacking Poland as well. Uh, Alexis abolishes assemblies of nobles, trying to get rid of the, the power of the boyars or the nobility. And, of course, Michael and Alexis and other Romanov leaders were going to use um, the gulag approach. If you dissent, you will be killed, you'll be sent abroad. A great example is the old believers. Um, the old believers are the more traditionalist orthodox who don't like the state stepping in control. The old believers were then sent on a one-way ticket to Siberia just like the Cossacks. Now, think about it. As the Cossacks are headed out east, and you have the old believers heading out east, again, you have the expansion of Rome, uh, sorry, the Russian Empire. All right, I'm at 14 minutes, and I should have done a rough draft of this. I'm sorry. So here it is. Peter the Great, ain't he pretty? Take a look at the time period. Peter the Great will lead Russia. Uh, he's a Romanov for, uh, what is that about? Almost 50 years, around 1700. Peter the Great. Um, he had no intention of parliamentary government. He liked the absolutist model. Now, we give Peter the Great a lot of compliments. Remember, he's the great. But none of these greats should be given to him because he's a parliamentarian. He loved foreigners. He loved the impact that foreigners from Western Europe and Northern Western Europe had. He, uh, when they moved into Russian uh, Russia and they moved into settlements in Moscow proper, he used their knowledge um, about banking. He used their knowledge about um, 
trade and manufacturing and running a government to his benefit. Uh, he creates a bureaucracy. He organizes the military behind him. And he moves the capital to St. Petersburg. Here, there's the water. He loves water. He attacks uh, Sweden because he wants trade here. He attacks the Ottomans a few times because he wants trade here at Azov. These new ports give him more wealth and more ability to expand and trade. He built an entire entire navy. Um, his navy is completely built off of the examples he found um, in his travels here to Western Europe and also some of the wrecks of ships that he then copied. But these new fleets are going to allow trade and westernization. So here it is. The westernization slide. Look at this. These are just examples of the westernization that Peter the Great is famous for. Westernization. Now, westernization, by my definition, is when you become more like Western Europe and less like Eastern Europe. Um, but I will say that there's going to be a lot of his easternness where he picks and chooses the westernness to infuse. So he is not going to follow the Roman Catholic Church. He is not going to follow Enlightenment and deals. He is going to still be stuck in certain ruts that is Russia. But he tries to blend in a new Western way, which is not surprising because this westernization goes all the way through the 1900s. The picking and the choosing of Western beliefs to balance out the Easternness of Russia. I don't know if that all made sense. Hmm. A power by appointment only. The appointments through the Tsar. Noble councils are destroyed. St. Petersburg is created. Economic. So, purpose of creating... Uh, a more advanced economy. Um, but the thing is, he as he tries to create a more advanced economy and mining, he doesn't use free capitalistic labor. He uses serfs, and that comes up in a second. So I will say he wants to westernize, but he westernizes using a you know, 13, 1400 model, not the 16, 1700 model from Western Europe. So here it is. Russia is behind the whole concept of serfdom. They are behind Europe. Do you remember, Europe got rid of slavery 100 years before the United States got rid of slavery. More than that, actually. The book does a great job talking about Peter the Great and westernization, so I don't want to step too much. But I mean, we got the, you know, let's shave your beards, let's dress like the West. Women, we want you at social events. We want you being part of our culture. We want you going to become educated. Um, he's going to secularize institutes, you know, in a kind of an enlightenment and deal, not negating the value of religion, but let's uh, emphasize the power of uh, human thought. Um, I will say at the bottom of this westernization, the peasants at first benefited from Peter the Great and others, but at the same time, unbeknownst to them, peasants are being more tied to landlords than ever. Uh, the book has one of those questions, um, number three from the book worksheet, uh, questions on page 112. Uh, the only group to support the czarist attempts to modernize Russia and increase the power of the central government was B, the peasants. I have a very, very hard time uh, saying that the peasants wholeheartedly benefited and supported because they are going to be, you know, cursed by these choices that both Peter the Great and Catherine the Great make. Catherine the Great. Um, first of all, she's German-born. She wasn't even born Catherine, uh, but eventually she becomes the, the leader of the end of the uh, almost by 1800 Russia. So at the same time, there is the revolutions going on in France and in the United States, some of them based on enlightenment and deals, Catherine the Great is going to try and continue to lead through the absolute model. Um, she disregards the serfs' rights. She defends the powers of a centralized church through the state. Um, she squashes the Bugachev uh, rebellion, the the. Pugachev Rebellion was a, a rebellion led by an old military man who 
tries to lead the Cossacks and the old believers to rise up and fight. Um, Pugachev actually created an entire state of his own. He had a bureaucracy. He had a military. He had enlightenment and ideals. He wanted to free the serfs. Um, he wanted the a separation of church and state, so the old believers liked it. But over time, uh, she squashes it. And when she squashes the Pugachev Rebellion, she doesn't use that as an example of her then needing to be more enlightened. She uses it as a power to support her absolutist regime. I believe that eventually Pugachev is brought to um, her and he's cut up into four as part of this penalty. Yep, I had to say. Uh, now she's continued selective westernization. I'm going to get into that a little bit here. Was she enlightened? Well... Here's just a couple examples that make it sound like Catherine the Great was enlightened. All right. She valued Western art, architecture, and dress. Um, you know, people like Voltaire were people that she wrote with. Um, the Instruction of 1767, which is written on page 407 of your book, uh, makes it sound like she has a lot of new ideas to uh, westernize uh, the country. But at the same time, it was helped written by a committee, that, and that committee was dissolved. So the instruction of 1767 was created, but never implemented. Um, yep. The Charter of Nobility, which is shown right here. The Charter of Nobility, what it was, was kind of like granting power to the landed aristocracy. And a lot of you would say, well, that sounds like democracy, giving power to the people. Well, she was an absolutist who ran the military, so the charter of the nobility was nothing more than placating the aristocracy, telling them they had full reign of their own lands. Um, and by doing that, she helped solidify serfdom, giving the aristocracy's full reign of controlling their serfs. That, to me, is not an enlightened person. So what are the last uh, bits of power uh, through, through expansion? You will see that all this land um, from Poland and Lithuania to what is Finland and towards Sweden right here, and even ports around the Ottoman Empire and the Baltic Sea all the way out east. And of course, down here, fighting with China, and over here, coming to Alaska and going down the coast of Alaska, even towards Northern California, you can see that Catherine the Great was a great expansionist as well. Dramatic pause. I don't know. Enlightened? Or just a despot? Now, I'm going to mention this only briefly, but the book does a great job in the last two and a half pages of the chapter talking about social structure. So I'll let you look at this. Um, here's a cool visual that shows that over 55% of the land right here around Moscow was filled with serfs. Um, a, around 50%, a little bit less, uh, was serfs around Moscow. And the further you got actually from Moscow, the freer you got. That doesn't surprise that the Pukachev Rebellion occurred out over here between the Volga and the Ural Mountains river, sorry. Um, so 95% of the, the society of Russia is, is rural. Serfdom at first started like tenant farming, but eventually serfs were going to be owned. They weren't just even tied to land. They were owned, they were bought, and they sold, and that ownership was hereditary. Serfdom that occurred in the 16 and 1700s slowed the pace of technology, slowed the pace of capitalism, and promoted economic and social unrest. Serfdom was a huge reason why that uh, Russia lags behind Western and even Eastern Europe. Um, its dependence on it occurred too many years after the feudalism of Europe. So in short, feudalism of Russia held it back. And Peter and Catherine the Great, quote-unquote, the greats, um, sounded wonderful because they had Enlightenment ideals, they believed in Westernization, and they were expansionist, but their promotion of serfdom will help weaken their country, their society, their people. Okay, guys, so 
I will tell you that this was a slideshow that I made largely based off of the book. Uh, I hope it helps you get through it. I would encourage you to read the book, and I'm sorry if I were choppy. I did not feel like doing too many rough drafts of this. Um, in class, we are going to go look over the quiz that the book gives you. I think I tried to make sure I answered all the quiz questions on page 112 and 113, but I will also say that the answer key was wrong. As you'll see in the answer key has a lot of letter E options and there is no letter E options in the quiz. Alright, that's 25 minutes of fun. Take care guys.